where folks want to know all knowledge and understand all mysteries, don't they? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people claim that they may have that that knowledge of of, of mysteries and, and of things that, that, that everybody want to know. But, but, but I'm going to tell you this morning that this, I, I, I'm not going to pretend that I understand all things because I don't. Amen. Uh, but I need you to know that uh, I, I come to you with just more than just myself being a survivor. This, this month, really, for a lot of folks, if you look at it on a national stand, of what we celebrate, uh, it, it's really about survivorship. Amen. Uh, you, you, you'll see pink ribbons all around and women testifying to their story, surviving the terrible thing of cancer, and, and, and lots of things that go with that. Amen. And so we think about survivorship, Sister Jan, this month. But 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 uh, uh, survivorship. Amen. Uh, so, uh, you look at uh, you see in me. Uh, I see in many of you. Folks who have had their dreams and their plans uh, shattered. Uh, but they've also seen that when that happens, that the Lord's hand has also been at work and has ministered and has painted a much beautiful picture in every hue, every color. Amen. God is making a masterpiece out of us. Amen. He is. Amen. He's making a masterpiece. And so I don't really come to you as Moses did as he stands stood on the rock and he was lifting up his rod over the Red Sea and, and, and nor I do I get the feeling always of being the one that's marching across the Red Sea on dry ground as God's stacking up the waters. Amen. And sometimes I'm like you. Sometimes I'm floating on that sea wondering where the direction is and how God's going to provide. All of us are like that. Let's be transparent this morning. Let's let's be honest. And so uh, 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 I, 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 I love uh, when you, when you hear the story uh, from the USS Indy during World War II, and there was a man by the name of Eldie Cox who was uh, who was one of the ones who su uh, survived. It. He said it was getting dark. And uh, the guys were going out of their minds half the time as the ship uh, that's sinking. Uh, he said he guessed that there was times where he, he was even going out of his own head at times. But he said at that moment in time, he said he just began to make knots all over the life vest that was round about him, his life jacket. And he said uh, he, he made knots so tight that he could not even take it off even if he wanted to. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Pretty interesting. How would we respond if we were going down a sinking boat at the, the midnight, the dark hour? So here it is. No matter how dark the night gets, no matter how fearsome the creature, uh, uh, and he said this. He said, I'm not going to let go of the one thing that will see me through. This morning, this is what it's about. It's about tying ourselves so tight to the one thing Amen. That will see us through until we get home. Amen. Tie ourselves tight to the hope of Jesus Christ, to the power of the gospel. Amen. To the authority of who He is and what He's doing. I imagine this. I'm going to get to my text in just a few moments in, in Job chapter number 34. But I want you to think about this. When we read about Job, who was much like that, uh, I, I still believe at midnight that God is able. Do you in your midnight hour, do you still believe? Amen. At the midnight, do you still trust and have confidence that God's working? There's some men named Eliphaz, Bill Adam, and Zophar. And really, you know that these were friends of a gentleman named Job. And uh, we know the story, and you probably heard it said before. But when you have friends like Bill Dad, uh, 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 Eliphaz, and Zophar, with friends like that, who needs enemies? That's right, Sister Pitcher. That's right. Who needs enemies? And so they sat with Job while he was suffering for a week and they didn't say anything. And then once they started, it seemed like their mouth did not shut because they were on this mission. Let's get Job to admit uh, that he deserves everything that's happened to him. Then in our minds, everything will be all right in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Now let me just, I'm going to put a little clause in here. I understand that we're all 
Christians that are saved by grace, if, if, you, if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, and, 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 and as humanity, we deserve nothing than hell. I understand that. But when God saves us, He saves us from hell. And I believe this, that the benefits of living and serving Him are far greater than just an eternity with Him. But I believe that there are great blessings to be reaped on this side of heaven. Not that I'm simply living for this side. Amen. I'm living for eternity. But I must live on this side of eternity. So as I'm living, amen, I realize I don't deserve anything but hell. But I realize that the blood of Jesus washes me. And there He goes making sacrifices for His children who He don't even know if they're right or wrong. But He wants to make sure they're right. He's an upright man. He's an honest man. He loves God. He's just a great man. Yeah. And so they think that if they can get Him to admit that He's done something wrong that's not transparent to their eyes, then, then the world will be right. And so it begins to happen. They begin to talk to Him. And so the Bible says that there is a younger man that comes. His name is Elihu, and he listens to his elders, and he thinks that they should have more years' experience and more wisdom than him. Uh, but but, but uh, Elihu, he squares off with Job, and he ushers in the presence of God, and he bids Job to think upon the high thoughts of God. And so here he is. He's sharing all of the thoughts of his heart, and, and, and he says this. In Job 34, verse number 20, he said, The people shall be troubled at midnight. I just want to stop there. I know there's things preceding to that. But he said, The people shall be troubled at midnight. Amen. We live in a world where we realize that there is trouble at midnight. And sometimes we live... Sometimes it seems we live half an hour before midnight. Sometimes it seems that we live maybe 15 or two minutes before midnight. That's where we feel like we are in our lives, maybe physically, spiritually. But what does that mean? Now, I know that we probably think that I know what the midnight hour means. Well, let's think about it in terms that I can articulate it and you can audibly hear it and then you can bring it together in your mind. But midnight is this, Sister Jan. It means that it will be six hours since the sun is set, and it will be six more hours before the sun rises. So it's 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 right there in the middle. And so, uh, how many of you ever felt yourself somewhere between that 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 that, that, that setting of the sun and the rising of the sun? And in the emotional sense, we all know it too well where that midnight hour is, where maybe as parents you're pacing the floor, worried about your children, or maybe the midnight hour where sleep just doesn't seem to be finding itself, and you're thinking, I want to be sleeping, uh, or in that physical sense, uh, in the Midnight hour, uh, where where you you realize that, that that you walk out of the doctor's office with hearing the words that you don't want to hear, maybe a diagnosis, or maybe that's all I can do for you, or or in the physical sense, you you hear that your child's not coming back. What a terrible thing when I've seen parents and their child lying before the bed. Your child's not coming back. I think as a community, you know, I, I didn't even know this young man, Wellington, amen, but I think as a community, there's a sense of grief that we feel as well for a family that loses a child uh, just uh, 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 much more sudden and, and, and quickly than what our mind can ever predict or feels fair. So it's, it's that physical sense of the midnight hour. And, and the midnight hour is this as well. It's the division between a.m. and p.m. And, and it's where you've given your best, but you come up short. It's, it's, it's the midnight where you're hurt, you're disappointed, where, where, where someone walks out and is not coming back, and they don't even look back. And it's a midnight hour where you're upset. You can't eat, you can't sleep, you can't lay down. Uh, the darkest hour of your life, that's midnight. We've all felt it before. We've all sensed it before. And Job's very wise young friend says, the people shall be troubled at midnight. Now there may be some young folks in here and you're like, oh, that's good. I don't even understand what you're talking about. You live long enough. How about some of you folks who've lived? You live long enough and you will face a midnight. You'll face a midnight. And, uh, you know, where you find yourself 
floating on the sea, wondering how did I get here and, and, and what am I doing? And, and, and I'm a little bit farther. It's not just in the physical, but it's in the spiritual as well, where, where, where we are at the midnight, uh, spiritually speaking. And I, I, I think about those three, uh, the, or I'm sorry, those four Hebrew children that we know of, Hananiah, Michelle, Azariah, and, and, and Daniel. And they're, they're living in this world system where, where, where they know God, they've been trained of God, they worship God. God, but in the world system, the golden head, if you will, some of you understand what I'm talking about, the golden head, if you will, it's, it's bringing immorality to them, trying to retrain their brain to think a different way than the godly way in which God intended. And so Nebuchadnezzar, he brings them in, they're captive, these four young men, and he brings them into uh, the Babylonian kingdom. They've been taken hostage. They're led away, and here he wants to teach them a whole new language. He wants to teach them Chaldean, and, 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 and in the middle of all that, he's trying to just rewire their brain, if you would. We live in a world where we're told that when we think of taking a human life, that, that, that our sanctity for life is wrong. That's the world we live in. When we stand up for what we know is biblical as far as relationship and marriage, the world dubs the Christian homophobic. So we're living in a world that's just twisted. And so it can often bring us to a, a, a midnight hour. And so for the child of God at the midnight hour, we need to speak Christian. Amen. That needs to be our language. In 2 Corinthians 6, 7, the Word of God says, Wherefore come out among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Therefore, having these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and, and, and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And so here it is, Nebuchadnezzar sought to change their language, sought to fill their mind with a worldly philosophy. And, and if you know anything about a woman, her name is Gloria uh, Steinem. Uh, she's, she's a feminist from the 60s and 70s. She said this. She said that she hoped that one day to see parents raising their children to believe in human potential more than to believe in God. Amen. We need to rid ourselves of this crazy thinking. Amen. And say, God, we want you to be honored with everything in our heart, our soul, and in our mind. God, help us at the midnight hour to live pleasing to you. Amen. 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 Here it is. The world's system, they sought to take these four men, change their lifestyle, what they ate, what they drank, how they behaved. But it all comes down to this single thing. A love for God. Nebuchadnezzar could not change the love that these four men had for God. Listen to me for a few minutes. I didn't give you some In your midnight hour, there can be faith crisis. God, where are you? God, don't you care? God, why don't you allow me to get here? Sometimes it's our choice. It's where we're at. Sometimes God allows things to happen. Sometimes it's other people's choices. But the thing that can never be shaken in our midnight hour is our love for God. These four young Hebrew children said, we will not defy ourselves. We love God. Listen, they wanted to change Daniel's name, which means God is judged to Belteshazzar, which means uh, Baal will protect us. From Hananiah, God is gracious to Shadrach, which means inspired by uh, the, the moon deity. Michelle to Meshach, uh, uh, Michelle meaning, meaning uh, who is like God, Meshach, who is, who is like the moon deity. Amen. Azariah, God is my help to Abednego, servant of Venus. We are at the midnight of our lives. Amen. At times, emotionally, <laughs> physically, spiritually, economically, our faith is tested. Our theology then isn't just theoretic, but our theology, amen, is really put to the test when we get to the midnight hour. And, and I think it's interesting, Harlan Twibble, he talks about being on the USS uh, uh, 
uh, Indianapolis and his story about being out in the deep. He said he was there in the deep. He said with all these other men. And he said uh, all of a sudden they began to panic. They said we've not heard any planes flying overhead. Uh, we've not heard any news from, from, from anywhere else. Uh, uh, have we been forgotten? Have we been forsaken? And Harlan Trumbull said this. He said then all of a sudden he said I did this. He said I was like a chaplain. He said I got our men together who were scared and frightened and the depth and the place of uh, where we were. And I began to tell them about God. Amen. And who God was. And though that we may have been out of the scope of, of radar and planes, that we were not out of the sight of God's care. Even when we're in the dark and in the deep. He said and in that moment when that theology came at the midnight hour, our hearts were encouraged. Can I tell you, when you're in the midnight hour, the greatest thing that you need is to know that the Word of God is with you and for you. Amen. Our theology becomes more than just a theoretic things, but it becomes an experience Amen. where we trust God. See, it was at the midnight hour that Samson got up and he moved the, 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 uh, the, the gate there at Gaza. It was at the midnight hour that the Israelites said, we don't belong in Egypt. We have the blood applied to our doorpost. We're leaving. It was at the midnight hour that Ruth said this, I claim my dear kinsman, my redeemer. It's at the midnight hour that the bridegroom is going to come back. And is our lamps going to be full of oil? It's at the midnight hour that a, 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 a guest a visitor knocks on the door and is looking for bread. Amen. I need to tell you, we need to be ready at the midnight hour. Amen. It was Ernest Shackleton, the captain of the Antarctic uh, expedition. He said he looked for four things within the people who were accompanying him on dangerous journeys. He said he looked for optimism, he looked for patience, he looked for physical endurance, and the fourth, idealism, and the fifth and the last thing was courage. You know what the first thing was? That optimism. Amen. He wanted someone who showed optimism because that is true moral courage. Can I tell you that I believe this? That we have to be optimistic that God is working and moving in our life. Because we have no other plan or we have no other reason to believe otherwise. God's working. As a preacher, listen to me. My job is to preach to the bruised, the broken, the bad, and the fourth thing is the bored. <laughs> We've got to stir up a sense of hope, a sense of belonging. Amen. We've got to stir up particularly the bored. I've got to have a pure mind to allow God to work. Amen. And the most important thing that I want to do here this morning is this. I want to tell you that at midnight when trouble comes, amen, the test of your faith, you can survive. You can survive. You can survive. Maybe there's some here this morning, your faith is being tested and tried. We live in a world, sometimes it's better not to turn the news on. Sometimes it's better just to leave it off. Amen. We live in a mixed up world. We're living life upside down. We live in a world that, that their moral compass is anything but the Word of God. And it leads to chaos. Amen. But when we trust God, amen, I want you to know that you can survive. Amen. Midnight is when you and I come to the amazing conclusion that God is up to something and can keep us during this, this time of, of testing. There, uh, there he was on the Antarctic and two of his most trusted men, amen, uh, Shackleton, uh, he said, was men that had courage, men who were uh, uh, enthusiastic about the journey, knowing that he was not alone. Amen. They were optimistic. Can I tell you that Paul at the midnight hour after being uh, 14 days and nights uh, driven in a storm he said this. He said to the sailors he said fear not for the angel of the Lord stood by me this night. Sometimes we just need people in our midnight hour in our darkest to remind us that God is with us. Amen. That's the most optimistic thing that we can say to anybody. Don't know what to say when someone has cancer. Amen. God is with you. Don't know what to say when someone has just been left by their spouse. God is with you. It's the most optimistic thing we can say. He is with you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's going to see you through the midnight hour. And it's six hours after the sun is set. Six more hours before it rises again. God is with you. And He's up to something. Amen. Hallelujah. 
to know that God is never going to leave us. That at the midnight hour is when miracles happen. Amen. Optimism was more, uh, uh, more than courage because optimism is moral courage. The world says seeing is believing, but God says I flip it around. Amen. Believing is seeing. Do you believe God? Amen. Do you believe God for your situation? Do you believe God for your dark midnight hour crisis? Amen. So, uh, uh, the testing of our faith. We need the Word of God. We need it. We've got to believe. But I believe this as well. That we've got to build up ourselves in our faith. How do we do that? We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. We can be optimistic because we know whom we have believed in. And we're persuaded that He's able to keep that which we've committed unto Him against that day. 2 Timothy 1.12 says that. I want to ask you this morning, are you persuaded? I'm persuaded. Amen. The key to joy, the key to victory is being persuaded that God is able. Amen. I'm optimistic because I know First Corinthians 10.13 says that God will not allow me to be tested above that which I am able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape. Let me say something here. There's a lot of folks that always say, oh, God's promised that He'll never put more on my shoulders than what I'm able to bear. Did He say that? Did He? What's the reference? But He's promised that with everything, he'll make a way of escape. He promised. That's the optimism. This may be way more than I can bear, but I'm not bearing it alone. Amen. God is with me. Amen. He's promised that His grace is sufficient. His strength is made perfect in me. So I can make it through this. Amen. I'm optimistic because I know that my labor is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. I'm optimistic because God is thinking about me. And He wants to give me a future. And He wants to give me a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11 tells me that. I'm optimistic because His divine power has given me everything that I need to live an overcoming life. 1 Peter 1, 3 tells me that. I'm optimistic because Hebrews... Chapter number 13, verse number 5 and 6 tells me that He'll never leave me nor forsake me. I'm optimistic because God is not slack concerning His promises. 2 Peter 3, 9 tells me that uh, He will be there uh, for me and He'll never leave me. I'm optimistic because I know that He's with the church and He's going to give us revival. I'm optimistic because I know that Romans 8, 28 says that all things work together for good. Sometimes at the midnight hour, we've got to be optimistic because we take God's word, we grab to it, we apply it to our life, and say, God, I'm coming out of this midnight because you promised me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. I would have to do this this morning, but I, I, I won't. I thought about having you look at your neighbor and ask them if they're Pentecostal, but I believe that you're here this morning because you are Pentecostal. Amen. Now, what does Pentecostal mean? For some folks, that just means raising your hands. Pentecost means this. It means that we have experienced and we desire to experience the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. That God promised that He'll fill every believer. And it comes by the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And so when we begin to read in Jude chapter number, uh, or Jude, uh, obviously that first chapter, verse number 20, the Bible says, But beloved, building up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. You know something? Sometimes we just need a good old Holy Ghost time. Yes, yes. Just us and God. Where we pray in the Holy Ghost and it increases our faith. Amen. Think about it. Amen. The Holy Ghost, it is an abiding gift. It is a gift that God gives to us. Amen. The promise of the Father. Amen. We have the Word. We have uh, the, the praying and the Spirit. Amen. When we begin to pray. Amen. Brother David, you, you stoked my fire this week. He told me something. He said, sometimes all I can do is pray in the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's what we do to build up our faith, right? When, when we're struggling, when it's difficult, when we're at the midnight hour, when we don't know where the answer is, when we're disappointed by what's just transpired in the p.m. and we thought we'd get more done before a.m. and a.m. means there's several hours before the breaking of day. Amen. What are we going to do? Amen. We're just going to pray in the Holy Ghost and build our faith. If you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, seek it. And then the third thing is this. Psalm says at midnight, 
I will rise and give thanks unto thee because of thy righteous judgments. Though I may be troubled at midnight, I claim the promises of God. And I can cry out to God. And I can praise God. <clears throat> Hear me? Oh, yeah. Some folks, man, they're at the midnight hour. Black cloud hanging over their head. Whatever they can do to make it evident, you know, they'll wrinkle their clothes, they'll make them tire, they'll mess their hair, whatever it is. Man, it's just terrible. I believe God wants us to take the opposite approach. Amen. Amen. That God wants us to worship and praise at the midnight hour. Amen. If you read in the book of Acts, you'll read uh, 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 on the day of Pentecost, amen, that here they were, they were speaking in other tongues, and it was tongues known by other individuals, and they begin to testify, what is this, the tongues that are being spoken of? Well, they're speaking of all the wonderful things that God has done, the wonderfulness about God. Do you know what God wants us to do at the midnight hour? He wants us to worship Him. He wants us to praise Him, amen, because we're coming out. Psalms 149, verse 6 through 9, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and the two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishment upon the people to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute them, the judgment written. This, this honor had all the saints. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. We have the ability, I believe, to chain the enemy up when we worship Him. The enemy would love to run havoc. He'd like to keep you up at the midnight hour. He'd like to poke and make fun of you. He'd like to see you lose sleep. But I believe that when we begin to pray, we begin to gag the enemy that he can't lie to us anymore. We chain him up that he's not able to have the upper hand and the victory over our mind. Hey, listen, I know you all know how to get here. This one we're close with Charlie. We're ready to come to piano. We found Paul and Silas at the midnight hour, and they prayed and they sang praises unto God. In the book of Acts 16, you'll read, Sister Jan, that as they were singing and praising God at the midnight hour, that the prison began to shake. All the feathers fell off, so they were released, and all the other prisoners, Brother John, were released because of the worship that was going on with Paul and Silas. Amen. It was evident that everyone around knew that God was working and moving because they were worshiping at the midnight hour. You see, the real reason for our trial, the real purpose behind our darkness is really like this. If I could, I would, I would shut off all the lights this morning. I would lock the window. I would show you a velvety type of material, and I would shine a light on it. And then I would take a dive in of praise, and I would throw on that. And you would see the beautiful sparkle and that beautiful ornament of praise in the darkness. You see, because God wants praise this morning in our midnight hour in our darkness. Amen. That is why we're in the midnight hour. Amen. The study of darkness and everything around us, but the brilliance and the sparkle of faith when we begin to worship and praise God. How amazing. If you were to close your eyes this morning and you would think about your life and maybe some of your darkest moments or maybe even where you're at now, maybe you feel like you're at the midnight hour. I don't have answers. I don't know all the mysteries. I don't have all the knowledge. I've been there too. But I do know this, that at the midnight hour we can trust God. Skeletons say, give me an army. Give me men who will sail with me, who will have optimism. I believe that our faith rises as above the status quo. Because we know God's working. Do you know that in the news this week, there was a pastor who was imprisoned in Turkey who was released in back upon American soil. 
He made it through the midnight hour. He made it through the midnight hour. Why did it happen? I don't know. But I know the end result is God is glorified. Amen. Maybe it's because we can experience comfort. Maybe it's because of others who are, if you would, incarcerated by their situations of life will find freedom as we have freedom in worshiping and trusting God. Don't get overwhelmed by your predicament. Amen. Just stand upon the rock of faith and say, my God is able. God is able. I want us to do this this morning. I don't ever want to just have a standard way that we come and we do our morning worship. But I want Sister Holly to sing this song. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. I don't need to know. Not unless you want me to know. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't in your midnight hour. But if you are, and Sister Holly sings this, and the saints sing this, I want us to come around the altar this morning with optimism. Whatever that situation is, that it seems like the light of day has been a long time, seems like it's a long time before you see the light of day. I want you to take God's word and say, God, I'm standing on your word that I am an overcomer. I want you to know that we are more than victorious, that God will never leave us nor forsake us. You're surrounded by people of optimism. I want you to allow the wind of the Holy Ghost, as, as the Spirit of God spoke to us, the wind of the Holy Ghost to blow and to blow hope and truth into you. So if you're able to stand, stand at the altar. If not, grab a pew, sit. But most of all, what I'm asking us to do is come and worship God in the midnight hour or with people that are in the midnight hour. Would you gather in? Amen, would you come? Lift your hands, Sister Holly. Go ahead, start singing. Amen, let's sing this together. Amen, I praise your name. I praise your name. Amen, I believe the chains will fall when we take God at His word. Amen, when we have a lot of faith, I don't see it, but I believe it. And believing is seeing this morning. Let's get around. Amen.